So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we have Mark Stevens, um, a voluntarist from Arizona who's doing a lot of work um, demolishing uh, judges <laughs> and lawyers in their own field. <laughs> so, so, Mark, could you uh, tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, well, I've been helping people be there, you know, defend themselves against bureaucratic attacks since about 96. And uh, from what I learned by going to court myself, and, you know, it's a continual process that, um, you know, seeing what works, what doesn't, what's effective, what's not effective, what may be true but not effective. And so you kind of, you know, take what's effective and discard, you know, what isn't. And, Road Adventures in Legal Land, it was based on my personal experience. Pretty much everything in the, well, all the experiences that I describe in the book really did happen. And it's all real. And, and some of the people have actually been on the radio, on the show. And uh, from there, doing that, I started doing the radio. And other people heard me. And I had the website. And so I started helping more and more people. So we, it went to where I was not just helping people in the U.S., but also Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, uh, parts of Europe, like, you know, well, English speaking anyway. Nice. And it, it's basically just. Uh, Helping people do it themselves instead of uh, spending uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on a lawyer just to screw them in, in the end anyway, which is something that just happened to someone yesterday. They were supposed to have made a deal where, and I didn't know about this because you know, with the lawyer, because I don't recommend people use lawyers for anything, but uh, unless you're really up against the wall and you just you, you can't speak well. But uh, the deal was supposed to be a year. The judge, ref you know, did his own thing and gave him five. So well. Right. Uh, so that's what the that's what doing what an attorney uh, did. So it, it's just using basic logic also, and really looking at what the situation is stripped out from an anarchist point of view, of course, mm -hmm. and and you know like from the, the Spooner mindset, and 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 using that uh, perception of all, our step anarchist perception of the world and using that to uh, uh, defend against a bureaucratic attack. It's just a way of stripping through all the spin and being able to reframe it in a more objective way so that other people, let's say a jury, can say, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, the prosecutor, he's just a lawyer spinning the truth to make this guy look bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm um, like, I think most Voluntarists understand, you know, that we debate with our peers, we debate with our family, our friends, you know, people you meet on the street. But most people, for some reason, maybe they don't consider debating with, like you do, lawyers and judges, <laughs> right? Which is basically where you take the same arguments and you bring it into that. Would you say is that is that accurate? I would. I would it's accurate only that the only thing I would just take a little bit of issue with is that because I uh, is debate. Okay. Okay. It, it's something that when. I'm, I'm just asking questions. So I'm in a spirit of resolution. So I just want you to help me understand your position and we can pay the fine and we can go home. Of course, when you walk through the process of trying to get me to understand, you're not going to be able to, <laughs> you're not going to be able to support your argument. And that's why a lot of these things get tossed out. So uh, what happens, the, the debate word comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, debate and argue, which is basically like a kind of a straw man thing that these agents do. So mm -hmm. you'll ask them, well, what evidence do you have, in fact, that your laws actually apply to me. Well, I'm not going to argue the law with you. <laughs> I'm not going to debate the law. I, I, whoa, whoa. You, I, didn't, I didn't do that. So that comes up all the time. But I, I, I believe in, in, in with, the, with the anarchist perception or with the scientific, well, anarchy, anarchist, scientific, rational, uh, if, if, when, you, when you look at the situation for what, how it really is and you strip out the spin, then you can just go in and you can ask questions in a Socratic way and be able to strip that false perception of legitimacy that, that they enjoy, that, that so-called, uh, what is the, they, they seem to enjoy a moral uh, uh, high ground. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, definitely. Right? And, and so what, what, I, what I do is always engage in questions in court and out of court to resolve the, whatever problem is, is being presented to me, and we just want to ask questions so, so that we can come to a resolution. It's just that by asking the questions and staying on point and uh, identifying logical fallacies and getting to just really what their position exactly is, 
you know, they know it's untenable, and that's why it usually yeah. will go away, or they'll they'll respond in a rage. So, so it seems like when I, I watched a few of your videos, and you um, you start off with the central question, which is what you just said. You know, prove to me that the laws apply to me, um, and not just you know, not just because I'm I'm here, but give me evidence, right? And and so if they say the Constitution is evidence, do they sometimes tell you that? Well, I I know that the operating presumption is, and this is you if you go to the website, you can hear dozens and dozens of call of shames. Nobody is going to turn around and debate or well or uh, uh, disagree with you or me or anyone else when we say that the way all governments, not just U.S., it's not just the lunatics in Long Island. All of them operate under the single operating presumption. If you're physically in China, Chinese law applies to you. If you're physically in Long Island, New York law applies to you or Arizona, where happens to me. They all will agree with that. Mm -hmm. So I start, and that's, that's where we have agreement. Okay, so I understand your initial position here is that you have jurisdiction because if I'm physically in Arizona, then your constitution and laws apply to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So that's kind of the Socratic method. So you understand and you're both in agreement with, with each other. With This is my, uh, I don't like to say opponent, but this is, this is the agent's position. So I have agreement. Now it's time to deconstruct that. I'll start asking questions, how and why questions. I want to get more data. And then when I get a different position, I want to confirm, okay, so this is your position, and then ask further questions. Mm -hmm. So when you're a... I'm sorry, when you're a bureaucrat, though, and you're doing it on a foundation of lies, it doesn't take that long. It doesn't take that many questions to, to uncover the fact that they, they re their argument re is not based on any facts. It's not based on any logic or, or any kind of rational thought. Yeah. So, so, but have you had people tell you or lawyers or judges uh, refer to the Constitution as being proof? As it yes. But wait, wait, well, uh, let me give a, a, an example from not too long ago, where people would look at them as some kind of authority. Because I think the the more the more they're considered an authority, the harder they fall. Okay. And so this guy Nicholas Court is an, a is a deputy senior attorney general in New Hampshire. His job is to argue in front of the Supreme Court. I will not take away that the man is probably damn good at what he does. Mm -hmm. And others are going to say, "Wow, he's they're going to put him up on a pedestal." Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. They'll never. They won't just say, "Well, the Constitution." They'll say, uh, "Well, they'll say because the Constitution says so." Yeah. And now, so if you listen to the recording, I'll, I'll say, "Well, so let me see if I understand your position." The Constitution applies because the Constitution says so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that circular logic? Not that's not really answering my question. Yeah. Again, I put the burden, I keep the burden on them instead of me making an affirmative statement. Isn't that circular logic? Now they'll disagree because it's their argument, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people are going to put out forth a fallacious argument that their entire livelihood is based on, and then agree that that's fallacious? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they so I put it to them in the form of a question, and if I have to, then I'll change the context. And say, well, if I said my rules apply because they say they do, would you accept that? And of course, they they won't. Mm -hmm. So what Nick Court did was when he real see when I, it's what when Nick Court, the Attorney General, says it, it's authoritative, right? It sounds really good, but when some schmuck like me from Long Island <laughs> says the exact same thing, so. The law applies because the laws say so. Now it's starting to dawn on them. Uh, uh, so he plays the history card. Well, uh, uh, well Mark, it's, uh, it's not just because it said so. It's because of the, the history that went into uh, you know, how it was created. <laughs> so, you know, I'm an anarchist. I understand how these things work. So my follow-up question. Oh, oh. Let me see if I understand you now, Nick. The, is the history you're talking about the fact that everybody in New Hampshire is forced to pay you? And that's where he decided, I, I, got, I got to go. <laughs> I, I, I got to hang up on this guy. As a senior deputy attorney general, and I'm not, I, I mean, again, he's good at what he does. Yeah. He applies the law to people every day in front of the Supreme Court. He's, he's a damn good attorney. You can't take that away from him. Mm -hmm. I don't think much of attorneys, but 
how can someone like me, with no formal legal training whatsoever, zero, some schmuck from Long Island? I grew up in Selden, not too far from when you guys are. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I still talk like that sometimes. <laughs> how, the reason, it's not because I'm an expert and that I know the law better or I, 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 it's not. It's because I, I, I can look at things as they are, more as they are anyway, mm -hmm. and I could just ask some questions and I don't accept any sacred cows. Yeah. And that's the thing. As anarchists, we don't typically accept sacred cows. Yeah. Yeah, I guess as a, as a lawyer, you're just taught to accept that the law applies because the law applies. <laughs> and, and then you go from there, right? They never question that initial position. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I have brought into legal documents the, uh, the fallacy of its turtles all the way down. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? And, and so I, and I did this graphically, and I did it in the book, where they'll say that the Constitution laws apply. Well, okay, well, where's your facts? Because that's an argument. Yeah. That's all it is. When someone says, and the cops do it every day, but they're willing to kill you. Unlike, I mean, most you know, senators aren't going to actually kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cops will, and it's based on, because they, they, they so believe that, hey, if you're here, the laws apply, and I can do what I want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it, it's just an argument. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> okay. I just lost my... Oh, no, no, I was just saying, you know, the circular... Reasoning that you know it's written, it's, it, the law applies because it's written there, right? So, 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 so when you're in court, you bring up these logical fallacies to them. You say, no, no, that's argumentum ad baculum. You, you, you tell them that in court, and and do they yeah. recognize that as a <laughs> they they do they don't like to actually accept it. So, well, sir, it, it, you know, it's just like an attorney said to me the other day when I pointed out that 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 wasn't evidence. Where where's your actual facts? And then he hits you with the ad hominem. No amount of facts that I give you or no amount of evidence is going to convince you. So I said, oh, that's right. When all else fails, call your opponent a retard. Oh, that's what you pay $100,000 for an education for? Yeah. At the ad hominem? Yeah. I, I, don't, I may not necessarily frame the objection as a logical fallacy. It may be a formal objection that I'll make. So okay. it, may, it may just be that it's non-responsive. Okay, okay. I ask for facts. It's like if I ask for – this is a very common one, with, especially with, with the IRS guys. You say, uh, what facts do you have to actually, you know, to prove, you, you know, that the Constitution Code actually applied to me? And I said, well, that, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's a frivolous argument. The courts have long rejected that, Mark. <laughs> what the hell are you talking to? So I will say, uh, objection, it's non-responsive. I ask the question, I'm not raising an argument. I won't necessarily say, oh, it's a straw man. Yeah, okay, see, I see. I mean, I do, but I don't. I, it's not something that's necessary to do. I, I think when I teach people when we're doing the show, I think it's important that people recognize the fallacy for what it is, yeah. so that they can't object. The important thing is, is that they say objection, and if they say it's a logical fallacy, that's that that should be an, should be enough to to overcome, you know, to to have the objection sustained. He's not answering the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so oh, I, I remember. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I the turtles all the way down. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Oh, it's been a long week, my friend. No problem. Um, so you that you ask them what facts they rely on to prove the Constitution applies, and they'll they'll cite their code. I said, well, but I, I'm asking you what evidence there is that that applies. What they'll do is they'll quote a court opinion. Mm -hmm. That court opinion will then quote another court opinion, which is just one lawyer quoting another lawyer. So you've got your opinion. Well, what? supports your opinion sir oh the court said this and it's turtles all the way down yeah so it's basically That's, yeah so, so um what, what would that be like what uh, like what what fallacy would that be just uh, appeal to tra tradition maybe that I, I don't know if it's technically an appeal uh, an appeal tra to tradition i can't remember the actual the actual name for i always just refer to it it's turtles all the way down okay. and in court they're like what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and then I can explain, you know, how fallacious that is. And, you know, you may, I, sometimes I'll even give, oh, well, that's like, it comes from the old uh, 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 urban legend that somebody had asked, what, what, is the, what is the earth rest on? Well, that, my, my dear, is a, is a giant uh, elephant. <laughs> what is the elephant on? Well, that's simple. It's a, it's a turtle. <laughs> well, it's a turtle. And, and so then you're able to explain. I'm asking you for the evidence that your argument is based on. You're giving me another argument, or you're giving me an opinion, and that it's, it, or you, you're giving me nothing of substance to support your argument. Mm -hmm. What it comes down to is it's an appeal to an authority. 
Ah, uh, that's it. Yeah, right. Appeal authority because you know the authority has uh, jurisdiction or has has. Um, <coughs> it's right. R- right. <laughs> said so. Yeah, it's right because a lawyer said so. Yeah, yeah. So they'll make fun of us if you if you if you view it that if you take a rational, objective view of it, mm-hmm. they will turn around and say it's funny. The courts call that they don't call that a logical fallacy. They call it precedent. Yeah, well, that's right. You're saying that. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh is it still an opinion? Well, okay, so you're saying that your argument is correct because a dead lawyer said it was. Now, if you gave me the basis that that lawyer used to come to that conclusion, well, I got something to work. That's not an appeal to an authority. Mm -hmm. That he just happens to be an authority who has a logical basis for the argument. But they don't. And and, and, and the best that they can do is, uh, well, if you don't like, appeal it. Which is similar to, you know, asking somebody, you know, if you're an abolitionist for, for slavery and they say, well, how can you be against slavery? We've always had slavery. For centuries we've... <laughs> right? Your how can you be against it? How yeah. can you be against slavery? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, uh, appealing to tradition is, uh, is not a... Um, it's not a logical argument at all, whatsoever. It's, you know? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it, it's absolutely no support for the argument that there sh- you should, you know, slavery is should be good. It's it's just like with the logical fallacies that they use, and I know you mentioned Ad Bacchum, which is one of their favorites. It, it, but t- t- usually, what they have is is three main ones for for the purpose of, of trying to support the concept of government, and show that it's moral. So instead of actually having facts, they have three logical fallacies. Well, it's an appeal to authority. Well, it's the government. Oh, oh, okay. That doesn't that doesn't support the argument. They're just people. Two, it's an uh, you have the appeal to popularity. Mark, I heard an attorney do this several times in trial this week, this week up in in Alaska, and we we knew to address this beforehand because they all do it. And this is it. We've heard it a million times. We all know we're supposed to pay taxes. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, and it's just like uh, there's so many other ones that you can have. I'd love to have one with Bill O'Reilly where they say, uh, you know, you know, oh, so many people believe this. Yeah, Bill, do you believe in, in, uh, in, in uh, Islam? Are you a Muslim? Oh, you're not. Well, how can a billion people be wrong? <laughs> and it's so uh, the appeal to authority means nothing. Exactly. The last one, this actually came out in an article that I wrote about uh, uh, Jer- uh, Jerry Cobb, who's a spokesman for the Maricopa County uh, uh, attorney, the, mm-hmm. prosec- the head prosecutor guy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he said, this is the uh, argumentum ad baculum. So my question is, what evidence supports your argument the code applies to me because I'm physically in Arizona? Okay, so that's my question about his argument. His support was, every inmate in <laughs> our prisons is evidence the laws apply. <laughs> so I even spoke to him. And I said, you're telling me the support for your, your argument is true because you put other people in prison. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you go to the website, I actually did a really good Photoshop job. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> you saw that. Yeah, yeah. So your argument that that the, it, it, that the laws apply to me is true because you put other people in prison. Wow. Yeah. And coercion does not equal consent, right? Yeah, and I'm like, what? Are you? He he confirmed that the county attorney actually signed off and wrote part of this garbage. So like, you, you, you're trying to tell me that if I'm standing in court. Okay, and and it's beyond a reasonable doubt, even jurisdiction, every, whatever, if you're in civil or criminal, whatever burden applies, applies throughout the the whole thing. So even things that have to be proven like jurisdiction at at, at pretrial or, well, at arraignment, we're standing there in court and I'm asking you for the facts that that you have jurisdiction over me. And you're, you're honestly going to say the other people you've put in prison prove you have jurisdiction over me? The people we have already beaten and sent into rape cages are <laughs> <It's> proof. <laughs> Stop badgering me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, as anarchists, you know, I mean, the only reason why you're an anarchist is because you've you've cleared your mind of a lot of contradictions. You're thinking a lot more clear. I mean, still, we still have some, of course. It's, but it, it, we can see that. But there are psychological reasons that I go through in the book where the average person cannot process this information. So when you're when you're when your job depends on taking people's money by force, by forcing other people to give you money. You won't see a moral issue with that. And anybody who questions that is questioning you personally because that's how you live. And so the brain just kind of shuts down. The, 
you know, it's like the amygdala takes over and it's like, up, oh, fight or flight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and rational thought is gone. Uh, it's quite sad. I saw that a number of times in person uh, with tragedy up in Alaska this week. It's, it, it, you, you have to see it. It's like, it's like there was a, a study that I write about where they changed, they were t- studying perception, how strong perception was over the facts. And if, if so that they did, they changed the, the color of, of playing cards. So instead of a spade being black, they made it red. Mm-hmm. And so when they put it up to somebody and it didn't match their perception, they didn't know what it was. Hmm. The brain can't process the information, the facts right in front of them. If if they were taught to be for it to be one one thing, you're saying, right? If you're indoctrinated one way, it's you're physically you're not in, incapable. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, like um, yeah, my my kids. I have uh, two kids, four and two, and uh, and you know I go out with them a lot to you know parks and libraries, right? All. Stolen fund funded, <laughs> stolen currency funded, and people tell me you're such a hypocrite. How can you? How can you be an anarchist and you take advantage of library? Like, where else am I gonna go? <laughs> and, like, and also, you use the roads. What a hypocrite! How am I gonna get to places? <laughs> if I don't use the road. What do you expect me to do? You know. So, <sighs> you you get you, that? It, 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 yeah. I, well, I, no, I, I've gotten. Well, I guess I have gotten that, but mainly from really pissed off radio show hosts. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not too many people. Uh, most of the people I know uh, don't bother talking to me. If they disagree, they ju- we just don't get, we just avoid the subject. But uh, they know I don't pay taxes. They know I actively encourage people not to pay taxes. And they know that there are certain things where you have no choice, like you just mentioned. Uh, will I think what it, so what it, the big one where you're a hypocrite would be if you file for bankruptcy. That because th- you you have a choice. Mm-hmm. It sucks that you may be in that position because some lunatics in Washington D.C. and, and New York City and London, you know, cause. I, I get that, yeah, yeah. but you don't have to necessarily do it. The, another one is you don't have to accept Social Security. Yeah. You know, so I, I know Jeremy uh, uh, Carl Watner at Voluntarist dot com writes. Uh, he's got a number of articles about that. You don't have to. So that's where you could be seen as. Is is be contradicting your 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 beliefs, but going to a park? I mean, you, you know what? <laughs> Come on, get, get get give me a better argument than that for hip, for hypocrisy. Yeah, I mean, my kids. It's funny, like uh, now that the school year just started, um, you know, all you see are books on, you know, first day of kindergarten, first day of first grade, first day of middle school, first day, and uh, it's funny, like they're not going to be anywhere near those places, and. Uh, going to be interesting for them growing up because you know all the time i see school buses coming back and forth and 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 um you know i just it, 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 I, I can't separate the similarities between school and prison i don't know have you have you made these uh these uh, correlations like there's a lot of uh, interesting similarities between these two not not least of all is that they both use the same vehicles to transport they're inmates. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right? that's a good point. Right? <laughs> well, what we did in court, we were, we owe, I believe in exposing a gun in a room. If we can take the moral justification that they still enjoy, then, and because that, then the, the more people will not see them as the good guy. That's very, very bad for them. Mm-hmm. Very good for us. Our job as anarchists and activists is to is to strip away and show that they don't have a moral high ground here. And so when you see things like in Ferguson, where the police were losing the moral high ground, things got ugly. Mm-hmm. And they were getting out of control. And I applaud that. Not the looting and stuff like that, but the non-compliance and the civil disobedience. Yeah. I would like to see more civil disobedience as far as the tax codes come out of that. Yeah. But they, but so I, exposing the gun in the room is always a very effective thing to do. It really underscores everything that I recommend that we do when we're in court. And so we did that this week where we brought out the gun in the room. And we were able to get witnesses within the first minute of a cross-examination to prove that they were, they were perjuring themselves. Mm-hmm. And I understand they're, they're caught in the middle. So one of the questions was, you look at the witness. And, a lot, and, and as far as I know, I, I, I don't know anyone. I'm not saying I'm the original one here, and I'm certainly not claiming any kind of IP. <laughs> well, one of the questions that I think that everybody should ask a witness, uh, and we did this, it was very, very effective, where you, you say to the witness, um, who forced you to uh, testify today? I'm not being forced to testify Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I maybe I'm mistaken. 
you're not on the subpoena. I'm on the subpoena. All right, I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused. You just said you were not, nobody was forcing you to testify. You're doing it freely, but you're under subpoena. That's right. Yeah. You know, and, and the jury's bewildered. Like, what the hell is he doing? He just proved perjury. The, the witness is not credible. Mm -hmm. the, and it, but you're, you're exposing the gun in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, didn't... So we even said... Well, I had the, the guy I was working with, I, I had him ask, I said, it was in the, it, I had written it down for him because we knew we would get resistance to this because they're terrified of the judge and the IRS coming after them for saying something like that because it makes the prosecution look bad. Well, it should. <laughs> and so he said to the judge, could you please instruct the witness on what would happen if they, if they refused to comply with your subpoena? And he's like, oh, I'm not going to get involved. You are. You're the only reason why they're here. You forced them to be. Oh, rah, rah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it was that. It's when you it, go and you rip out the moral ground that they stand on. It, yeah. I mean, it all it collapses from there. You just showed with just a few questions. The, the witness just committed a felony for the prosecution. <laughs> they are so. What that does to me say that evidence we always look at the data right that evidence that they purged themselves in the first minute of a cross-examination tells me they are so afraid or so biased in favor of the prosecution they will actually purge themselves rather than tell the truth and make the prosecution look bad yeah. how the hell could you possibly get a fair trial under those circumstances have you ever um made a, a judge like so angry that he like I don't know, like, like sent you away or uh, what do you call it? Hold you in contempt of court or anything like that? I, yeah, I wrote about in Adventures in Legoland. Sid Weiss, who was in the uh, Mesa Justice Court. No, Mesa City Court. Mm -hmm. He got so upset with me that, and it was so visibly upset and screaming that the cops didn't do anything to me. Really? They didn't? Yeah, they, they did nothing. They didn't, they didn't haul me away. They were like, what? They, like, what the hell is going on, Mark? And in fact, the prosecutor, Bill Burke, a week later or so, when I went to the pretrial, he said to me, it's in Adventures, he said, what What the hell did you say to Sid to make him go so, so go crazy like that? I mean, the guy was uh -huh. bonkers. And I thought, he, I, thought I was going to get a judge to actually have a stroke or a spontaneous nosebleed. Oh he kind of had a thing going with someone online who would be the first one to do that. <laughs> And I thought Sid was going to be it. Oh, shoot. So he, Bill, t I said, you heard about that? He says, we all heard about what you did to Sid. <laughs> <laughs> so what, you just caught him in a fallacy or something? Maybe. Well, what happened was I was asking for evidence. And I wasn't going to take a fallacy. I, I wanted the evidence the prosecution had given to prove his argument there was jurisdiction over me. That's yeah. not the judge's burden. It's the prosecutor's. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he gets, Mark, you are the most difficult man I've ever dealt with. And I said, I'm very easy to get along with, but when you try to con me, I'm not going to stand for it. You played straight with me, Sid, and we'll get along just fine. You try to lie to me, you try to put it over, and, and he just exploded. Get me the cop, get me the wow. And I'm, I'm just standing there calm. <laughs> But that's it. You know, he's trying to he's trying to put something over on me. I'm half Sicilian. I'm from Long Island. You know, my family was from Brooklyn. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we didn't take too well to that. That was one of the few things I I, I learned to value growing up. Mm -hmm. Don't take anybody's word for anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so let me ask you, what about your uh, your family and uh, how do they feel about what your you know your, all your uh, adventures? <laughs> Well, my, my wife is pretty much an anarchist, and I believe my children are also. I've always taught them that we, we live our lives by just a couple of rules. And that is, you're not the boss of me, which my kids understand, and that you just you don't order people around and, and use force to control them. Because you don't want that, which led to the second one we teach them is, you treat others the way you want to be treated. Or that, and that you, you don't do to other people what you don't want done to you. Mm -hmm. and it's a very simple way to live your life. And I said, if you live your life that way, you'll be happy, especially if you realize you're not entitled to a thing. Mm -hmm. The world, or anybody in it, doesn't know you anything. And if you remember that, you'll be doing pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, my kids have seen the bureaucrats, the bureaucrats firsthand screaming. 
Really? Wow. Screaming at me. So they come, to the, they come to the court with you to, to watch you? <laughs> well, they came with me one time. Just it, it was a non-government attack, and I was trying to pay, and the clerk just didn't understand. And, and she wouldn't accept the money. And I said, look, I'm, I'm late. I'm going to be late to an appointment. Let me just pay for this. And she said, sir, you have to file an answer. I said, I filed a motion to dismiss. You didn't accept it because I didn't pay. So let me pay so that you can accept my motion. She's IP, how do you feel about intellectual property? As an anarchist, uh, well, I think it's obvious. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I think it's a ridiculous concept, uh, the uh, from beginning to end, and that doesn't even that doesn't even include the fact that you know, at least now it relies on if force. It relies on the uh, the guns of government to actually enforce it. And it it's, the, the idea is completely ridiculous. I mean the. The idea, that, and I write about that in the book, and it's just, it, because it, it it has to be your idea, right? Well, how many original thoughts have any of us had? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and I I remember uh, I was reading someplace that you know how can you how can you have ownership of patterns like there's patterns in nature models you know nobody has ownership of those right you know you can freely use those and now now we have with the internet and with you know, you can copy anything, you know, you can get, you know, through, uh, what is it, um, Pirate Bay, you can get copies of whatever you want, um, but, you know, I, I talk about this with my brother, he's big into rap, and he's saying, but what, what if somebody spent years doing something, don't you think they need protection? <laughs> but the question is, how far are you willing to go? Like, are you really willing to throw someone in a rape cage for copying your song, you know? Is that sure? Right, and, it, and that's what the, the entire concept of property can be boiled down to. That it boils down to, you know, if the initiation of physical force is 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 always wrong, then a lot of the concept of property starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And I think what what really started me getting me thinking about that, and I think the concept of property is good and bad. It has been, it has been the basis of some great innovations, continues to be, but it has also been the the foundation for most of the world's, uh, you know, genocides and carnages. Mm -hmm. It is every war is fought. Every war is fought over property. Mm -hmm. Everyone, right or wrong or whatever we feel about it, they're always fought about fought over property. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to, so the example that I've given before is, you know, like tomorrow I'm driving back out to California, so you've got these huge stretches of the Arizona desert that you're going through and in California, and you see these signs where somebody in San Diego or Hawaii is claiming to own the desert. <laughs> and so, you know, you've got a lot of time to think out there, and you start yeah. thinking, well, if, if, if somebody claimed to own the world... <laughs> we would laugh. We, we would laugh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's that's not a problem there. So uh, okay, well, what if they claimed? Oh, okay, that's ridiculous. All right, we get it. Huh? Well, what if someone claimed to own a continent? They owned Asia. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still laughable. Mm -hmm. At what point do we keep reducing this down to where it becomes? plausible and then becomes a good idea and mm -hmm. there's still to me it seems to be land that you can work but still there's still so much fuzzy mist there it, it's just not i guess you know someone had called and, and a friend of mine had said because i was i said i was willing to uh, use deadly force if someone broke into my home mm -hmm. <laughs> and that gets you thinking well it's one thing to protect my family, but is it another thing if I'm willing to kill someone just because they're under my, my property won't leave? I mean, it would have to be more. They'd have to be doing some kind of threat. And there would have to be another yeah. nonviolent way to be able to resolve that. And I don't have all the... I, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I, so, I don't know the answers yet. So, because the way I resolve that is um, if you can take a piece of uh, property that's crude and uh, you know that's unadulterated and then you make something valuable that other people are willing to pay for you know your the pro the fruits of your labor to me that's what property is is that when you can transform something into into usable uh, and valuable things that other people cherish right and and if you can do that then i would say that's proof of you know ownership to me, uh, whereas like you know, like 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 um, like to say to say eminent domain, right? Go, you know, government owns certain parts of the desert. You know, like in the Clive and Bundy thing, right? <laughs> you remember when that? Yeah, when that happened. Like, how can the government own something when it's not even? They're not. They're not only just leaving it alone and not doing anything useful. They're like detonating nuclear weapons. <laughs> out there. Yeah, you know. So it's like so far in the other direction. <clears throat>
Yet they claim ownership. But, you know, the, yeah, well, right, and there is no government. There's just men yeah. and women forcing us to give the money. Yeah. The, the thing, the example that you gave is a good one, but it still has the, the same dilemma in that it, it depends on the scale. Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly what, for example, the British government through their, you know, their capitalist partners, of course, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not necessarily anti-capitalist. I don't like the force part of it because when you look at what the British Empire did was going and taking those natural resources from an area and controlling the people and enslaving them. And it was, so it, it, it's, a, it's the scale that you're talking about and it's that scale that I think is so fuzzy and really makes it difficult to, to have hard lines. You know, this is property, this is not. And it, it, it's just too... Uh, yeah, it's not an answer that I, I, that I have yet. It just seems to be the more decentralized everything is, the smaller in scale things are, the more plausible, more manageable it is. Yeah. And it seems to be the less violence that has to be. But once you start into a large scale thing like a forest, mm -hmm. you get a group of people claim they own the forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had the answer, but... You yeah, know, it's, yeah. it, and, and also this, this argument, you know, or this, I guess, debate that we're having about property, you know, the intricacies of property is similar to, to an anarchist debating with a minarchist, which is, which is kind of, um, it's, it's, it doesn't make so much progress because, you know, both, both of us want less government, you know, we want absolute nothing, but they want maybe like 95% less, which even that is still so unrealistic that to argue that that last 5% <laughs> to me is, is, uh, a lot is uh, he's like unproductive <laughs> you know so i would rather us focus on um the the more difficult mission which is right now the mission at hand right which is the myth of authority and and yeah. just uh you know abolishing uh people's belief in um rulers <laughs> you know that people have yeah. some people have a right to steal other people's property and give it to other people who don't have not earned that property we we actually had that happen in court. I I wrote up a cross examination for an, an IRS expert witness, and and we bring that out. And they, they said, "Look, is it immoral to force people to give you money?" Well, yeah. Isn't that what you do every day at the IRS? Mm. Yeah. Well, it, and she makes excuses, and and she said, well. Okay, uh, we'll get back to that in this moment because you're on the job and it's the the, the law. We'll we'll get to that. So, would you do it in your private life? Mm -hmm. And you know, y you start breaking down those those contradictions in their head. You know, it, it, it if it's wrong to force people to give you money, it's always wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and what they'll do is they'll say, like I think you mentioned earlier about, well, you got the roads, and you know, the roads are the big one. That doesn't change the, the immoral act. Exactly. It doesn't you know? It, it doesn't matter if, if I rob from from Peter to give to Paul, and Paul really needed it. It's it's still it's still considered morally morally wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they talking about the IRS. I because um, <clears throat> I'm an acupuncturist, right? So I used to uh, work in a car accident clinic, and uh, I had an uh, an IRS agent <laughs> working there one time, and. Uh, and that was when I really was getting into this stuff, you know, towards the end. <clears throat> and, oh, my God, I had to restrain myself from saying anything inflammatory to him. But, you know, he would come in. He was, I'd say, you know, how's your day? He's like, oh, I had a rough day at work. <laughs> and, I'm, I'm, and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh. how can you think of a government? See, this is, this is the, the, uh, the confusion, I think, where it comes from is people think of these positions in government as jobs, like, to me, a job is something that actually produces value for society, right? Increases wealth. <laughs> it makes us all, you know, increases standard of living, right? Whereas, you know, government, and, and also, by the way, is also um, only exists because there's a demand for it to exist. Whereas government jobs, you know, subtract wealth from society, lower the standard of living, and it only exists through force, right? There's no, absolutely no demand for it to exist, other than, I guess, the, the, the belief that in people, of, you know, the myth of authority and the belief that it should exist, I guess, you know. But, um, yeah, it's just sad, you know, because you know, then people say, well, well, if we get rid of the government, what are all these people with these jobs going to do? <laughs> you get that argument? Uh, I said, well, let's take take a look at that. There'll be an extra few trillion dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Available, and there won't be nearly the restrictions that you have in 
doing something on a voluntary basis that people are willing to voluntarily pay for. Uh, so uh, that I don't get too often. The biggest one is what about the roads? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, would you rather have roads never worked on again or continuous genocide? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, 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 this is why I, I, wrote this, I wrote this down just today. And, and, I, and I think this is going to be a pretty good way to, to reach people. Mm-hmm. Because generally what I'll do is, is look, is there, if, if I was to do things like the government types, and I, and I ask government agents this all the time, and it really pisses them off. It's a simple question. If I did things in the same manner as you guys, and I forced people to give me money, would you consider me a criminal? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you see, and most of them, they, they know where, where I'm going, so you see, you see the issue here. But I think, I, I think for some people, it, it'd be softer to just ask them, do you have any principles worth standing up for? And, and what I get to is, is it wrong to attack people? Is it wrong to initiate force? Do you want people to initiate force and threats of force against you? Well, no, of course not. Great. We got a great starting point there. Are there any exceptions to that? Is it, real, is it ever acceptable to initiate violence or, or threats of violence against them? Oh, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How does government get money? <laughs> exactly. And, and so now you can, they can start to resolve the contradictions in their own head, mm-hmm. just like I did, and I'm sure you did. I mean, I think that we all come down to being anarchists because we couldn't resolve the contradictions in our head. Yeah. And that's what we need to help people do. Everybody already is an anarchist. Everybody, who want, whether they want to admit it or not, because mm-hmm. they don't want to be attacked. Mm-hmm. So their principle is, I don't want to be attacked. Well, neither do we. <laughs> yeah, and, I firmly believe that we were all born as anarchists and that we were slowly um, indoctrinated first through, you know, statist authoritarian parental upbringing and then then to solidify that in in the uh, government schools, right? That authority always knows best. You know, you don't solve problems on your own. Always appeal to authority, um, <clears throat> and uh, and and that's you know that's how that's why it's so important. And and kids, I think, exhibit this when when they say simple phrases like um, you know that's not fair or this is mine or <laughs> you said so. You know, <laughs> and to me that that implies like understanding of contract verbal contract anyway right and agreement yeah agreements um respect respect uh, uh what do you call that like um just equal i guess you know yeah yeah like the golden rule you know you don't want anybody to do things that uh, that you would not like done to you right right so um although you know i guess kids <laughs> when they're too young they they uh, have to learn that one i guess <laughs> my, my four-year-old sometimes <laughs> you know you know, he go, goes on my tutorial, but eventually, you know, they, they understand that. You know, they, they learn that pretty quickly. Yeah. And it's just well, simple. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It, the thing, that, one of the things that I noticed about my own children, and that really helped me, you know, get back to that, because you sort of lose that, that this attitude, that this, that this uh, kind of view towards life, is when you're a child, you're very inquisitive. You're always asking questions. And I think that's, an, it, just, it, it just, we're curious about the world in which we live in. Mm-hmm. And every great advancement usually comes from asking questions. You, how do things work? How can I make this work? Why is this phenomenon doing this? How can I use this to help better men? And, and it, I think what, it's bred out of us that when we go to school, it's all about just memorizing stuff. It's not about critically thinking. It's, it, 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 to, to be taught to be a skeptic and have an open mind and just let's collect as much data as we can before we start making conclusions, people. And, and it's bred out of us. Mm-hmm. Because, very, because they, they don't want... Look, the people that force us into their schools, the people who force us to give the money, don't want their, pe- their victims being inquisitorial and asking questions because it's too easy. And I've proven it thousands and thousands of times. It is too easy to show the gun in the room and that they are not who they say they are. They're just people forcing us to give the money. And I have, I have requested people, come on the show and show me where I'm wrong. Show me a gap in my logic. Where, are, where am I getting my facts wrong? That government is men and women forcing us to give us money. It, 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 that's what it is. Now, you come up with an argument. If you can't show where my facts are incorrect, you damn well better come up with an argument to, to, to justify it. Mm-hmm. And that's where they can't do it. 
that's where you start getting into the logical fallacies. So, so how many people have actually come on your show and, and, and challenged you? I've had a number of people actually uh, challenge me, and I've, I, I welcome them to come on, and uh, the few that actually have come on have ended the show uh, apologizing for saying X, Y, Z, that, I was, that I, my facts are right. This is not about me being right. This mm -hmm. is what, the fa what does the data, do, what does the evidence tell us? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we've always parted as friends. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I have critics that think that I'm an idiot, I'm a wacko, I'm taking advantage of people, or gullible people, uh, and, and that none of my arguments have ever made any merit whatsoever. So well, why don't you come on the show? If my argument that there's no evidence proving the laws apply, come on the show and provide the evidence. Yeah. We have a standing $5,000 challenge and my friend Paul is the backing. Wow. Uh, that nobody will take it. We're actually going to try to do a, a crowdsource where people can, to be able to get this one critic on the show, to provide the evidence. Because mm -hmm. I thoroughly refuted his historical aspect. He said, well, the people ratified it. <laughs> no, everyone is forced to pay. Nobody agreed to anything. See, that's direct evidence. That counts, not your circumstantial speculation garbage. That, but... Um, we figured if we could do a crowdsource to just to have him come on the show and, 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 and stay on for the entire show, a charity of his choice would get the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. how does he lose there? Yeah. Right? And, and he gets the opportunity to publicly humiliate me with the evidence. <laughs> Very nice. How yeah. that, that's win-win. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but, but he refuses... Because when all you have is logical fallacies, appeals to authority, and, and uh, appeal uh, argumentum ad baculum, well, yeah, then, then of course you're not going to come publicly on the air with somebody mm -hmm. who, who can call you out on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting what you said before about um, um, how is society going to improve. You know, you say like we, we, they're they're always trying to be out of the of the of the younger generation that inquisitive nature, and and how does a society actually improve without that skepticism? <laughs> you know, because don't you always want society to progress and move forward? And and if you if you if you destroy that, then won't society just stagnate? <laughs> and well, you, yeah, well, look what the, <laughs> right? look what the Catholic Church did. Look what Rome did. The Rome uh, the, the popes was trying, but they they weren't able to do it completely. But they did a damn good job of murdering millions of people that, that you know, they, they stifled critical thought and questioning for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this, this idea that people shouldn't be asking questions is the idea of having a sacred cow. And I actually did a, you know, it was a it was a decent Photoshop job. I took a picture of a cow and I Photoshopped in for I am jurisdiction and thou shalt not challenge <laughs> because that is something that they do. They will actually tell you things. Well, Mark, you're an idiot. You don't understand. Jurisdiction doesn't have to be proven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but the AES, the uh, the NSA, and, and the IRS and the DEA. See, when you guys, when we file against them, they do challenge jurisdiction. And no, it's not a trial issue. They'll, they, so one of the things I'm, I'm going to be publishing soon is uh, where the ACLU sued the NSA in 2006. Mm. And that it, they, they, it got thrown out. It was a, they didn't have to wait to go to trial. These are just some more of those lies. Mm -hmm. But they try to tell you that the application of the law is just it's the the argument that the law applies to you is different. So that's again, you know, the double standard or an appeal, uh, a special, uh, the uh, special pleading fallacy. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's the same thing they use with government. Yes, it's wrong when you, you piece of filth anarchist, when you force people to give that, give you money. That is criminal and immoral, but not when we do it. That's your argument. That you're, you, it's called special pleading. Well, I'm not so stupid. I don't understand simple logical fallacies like this. But I agree. Whenever you have. Any situation, I don't care if it's anarchist, it doesn't matter who you are. If you stifle criticism you st and, and you say that certain ideas are off limits to debate, you know, to, 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 to discussion, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. You got a serious, that is really bad thinking and that has led to, well, we, we know what it's led to. Mm -hmm. That, that <clears throat> putting a muzzle on, on questioning, just being inquisitive mm -hmm. has led to the death of untold hundreds of millions of people.
Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I've encountered so many um, conversations with people who get you know viscerally angry with me when I begin to question government and its legitimacy <laughs> because there's so much history and emotion wrapped up in it. You know, yeah. like you know, the, the government they, they've helped people get out of you know child labor. It used to be horrible. You know, <laughs> people used to work long hours. In fact, wasn't that a good thing? <laughs> Well, it was it well, but what what about World War One again? I what? Yeah, I, right. Oh, that's right. If you didn't have a belief in government, you went to prison. Oh yeah. I have I actually have my great grandmother's naturalization, her application for naturalization, because they were originally from Newfoundland. And it says on there there are two things you have to swear that you do not believe in. You have to swear that you are not an anarchist, and they spell it out. Not bombs, and th- they, they got it right. Yeah. You cannot have a disbelief in organized government. And the other one was you couldn't believe in polygamy. I don't see that. <laughs> so, y- y- here, we're, we're not going to let you onto this continent yeah. if you don't believe in organized government. Yeah, I did. I did hear about that. I, I uh, now that you brought that up, yeah, there was a long list, you know, of um, different <laughs> different things like polygamists, probably, and yeah, that's different big... different religions, right? You know, <laughs> and anarchists just thrown in there. Yeah, that's yeah. really. Uh, it's really, and, and you're right. Like when when people think of the the benefits, the visible benefits of of what uh, you know government claims to have done that we conveniently forget all of the drone, you know, bombings and uh, uh, genocides and, you know, internments and <laughs> different things that, that is littered throughout history. And, uh, and somehow that's, that's okay because we have libraries. <laughs> you know? we have, yeah, I, it, it's, it's quite something. And in the, the, the double standard fallacy is particularly prevalent with Americans. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's 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 constant. Uh, if it's an American or an American ally, they can bomb and kill people indiscriminately. You apply that same damn standard to, let's say, the Pakistans, the Pakistanis. Let's say they sent the drone over Phoenix. Well, there was there was uh, we were sorry, innocent people got killed, but this is important. It is war. <laughs> it's not murder. It's war. <laughs> you know, that's why you have Americans that will defend the instant incineration of hundreds of thousands of people in in, in uh, Japan. Two two bombs. Mm-hmm. It's war. Yeah. Exactly. What if they drop? What if they drop that bomb on Miami? Yeah. It's war. It's okay. So. There would be horrible, cold blooded murderers. It's that same double standard fallacy. That it, it, it's so prevalent, and it, it's just an excuse for murder or whatever horrible b- behavior you're trying to excuse. Ah, well, it, it doesn't it doesn't apply to me. Yeah. It doesn't apply to me. Well, my gun says otherwise. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah, that, yeah. This reminds me of a um, <clears throat> there's a there's a quote. I forget who said it. If you kill one man, you're a murderer. If you kill many, you're a conqueror. And if you kill all of them, you're God. <laughs> Yes, there's also one in there that yeah, I, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, I didn't Stalin? No, no, was that Lenin? I forget who said that. No, I don't, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but then there's also Voltaire. He's, he was saying um, um, that you know, you one man commits a murder, but then you know, a group of men through the sound of trumpets, you know, commit murder, and that's war. <laughs> yeah, I, I think in the same vein, it was uh, one 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 murder is a tragedy. Uh, you know, a million is a statistic. Yeah, right. it's like it's no and it, it, all these all these justifications to uh, continue giving this false presumption of legitimacy to to a group of men and women who who deserve nothing but our disgust and disdain, and they certainly do not um, do not. Uh, what's the? Uh, I can't, they don't uh, need. Uh, we shouldn't be complying with. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> but they they don't deserve our compliance. Is what I, that they yeah. they, they all, the only they deserve is our contempt, and we should not be complying with them. And the only reason why they can get away with it is because enough people are still afraid of them and are complying. But there's more people every day coming to a realization that they do not have a moral high ground. They are not moral. They are criminals and demonstrably so. And they can't make a moral case for what they do. And that's why they hang up the phone. That's why. 
or they scream and yell contempt if you do it in court uh, because they they do not have a moral a moral basis. Uh, it, it, it's people people need to just reconcile the contradictions in their head and be adults mm-hmm. because when they do, they will proudly proclaim to be anarchists because that's all an anarchist is. It's not Mol- Molotov cocktails, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Not, <laughs> in, not unless it's defensive force. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, well, I don't want to keep you too long, so um, we'll finish up. So, so just let people know where they can find you if they want to learn more about your work. Thanks. It's uh, marstevens.net, and uh, all, the, all the evidence is there. Uh, I've got a ton of calls with the bureaucrats themselves, including an HD video with a federal magistrate in Phoenix admitting that the application of federal law was arbitrary, that there was no evidence to... to and that's on HD. And yes, uh, yes, of course he knew he was being videotaped. Yeah. But he is a, uh, a, uh, a libertarian... <laughs> As far as the the party, and he, you know, he's not an anarchist, but uh, we're working on him. Actually, before I let you go, did you hear of a guy called Mark Victor? Yes, attorney for freedom. What, yes. what, what do you think about his work? I think he does good work. You know, we see him at the at uh, the Freedom Summit in Phoenix, oh, okay. and see him all the time at Libertopia. Uh, he takes a different view of things than I do. I, I mean, he's an anarchist. Yeah. As far as I, mm-hmm. so, but as far as helping people in court, I focus on issues of fact. Mm-hmm. Mark focuses mainly on issues of law. He'll argue constitutionality, whereas I'll come out and say the prosecution has no evidence the Constitution even applies. Yeah. Well, the Constitution is not an issue until the prosecutor puts some evidence on the table it applies in the first place. Uh, that's something that would probably get him disbarred. Yeah. So that's a main, the, the main difference. I don't allow the prosecutor to have any sacred cows, and Mark does, because he, does, he doesn't attack it from that pati- particular perspective. Mm-hmm. All right. But he's done some great work. He's uh, he's he's got some good judgments for people. He's he's kept people out of prison. So uh, he, uh, that that's always a great thing. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I recently heard learned about his work too. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Mark Stevens, for uh, coming on. Um, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you.